So in today's video, we're going to talk a little bit about ENVIS, or Near Vertical Incident Sky Wave. It's a propagation technique used at lower HF frequencies for local or regional communications. It's typically used on 80, 60, and 40 meter bands. Mostly you'll see 40 meters in daytime and 80 meters at night. ENVIS utilizes low-mounted horizontal antennas. These antennas are typically one-eighth to a quarter wave or less in height above ground. What I would typically recommend is around 15% of a wavelength. And we're going to take a look at a diagram of an antenna that is recommended for ENVIS use. Now the thing about ENVIS is it takes advantage of about a 75 to 90% degree takeoff angle, which is very different than what you would see for antennas used for DX communications. They typically use a very low takeoff angle because it creates a more obtuse incident angle. And we'll talk more about that as we progress. ENVIS is more reliable than line of sight propagation, sometimes referred to as LOS, because it bypasses obstructions. It's typically used with great success in mountainous regions. It has a longer range than ground wave propagation, typically 300 to 500 miles, with the sweet spot being somewhere around 400 miles. Looking to elevate your amateur radio experience? Join the American Radio Relay League, the ultimate community for ham radio enthusiasts. By joining the ARRL, you will get access to educational resources to build your knowledge, exclusive publications, and opportunities to engage in public service. As a member, you'll enjoy access to four digital magazines. Take a deep dive with QST and build your skills. If not the ARRL, then who? We're the ones protecting the ham radio spectrum in Washington, D.C., ensuring our voices are heard. Use code APE1 for a free hydration pack with a one- or three-year subscription. So I wanted to provide a brief overview of propagation. The first we're going to discuss is line-of-sight propagation. And this is when radio waves directly move from a transmitting antenna to a receiving antenna. An example of this would be a mobile radio to a repeater or if you were using an HT with your buddy who was down the road. The next is ground wave propagation. And this is when radio waves move from a transmitting antenna to a receiving antenna across the surface of the Earth, typically considered short-range communications. This works better with lower frequencies and vertically polarized antennas than with horizontally polarized antennas. A good example of this that you would see in your daily life would be AM broadcast radio. Last, we have sky wave propagation. And this is when radio waves move from a transmitting antenna to a receiving antenna after being refracted by the Earth's ionosphere. An example of this would be HFDX communications. NVIS is a type of sky wave propagation. So that takes us to this diagram that I have here that kind of illustrates what we're talking about. So the blue arc in the sky, we'll consider that our ionosphere. Now our ionosphere is made up of multiple layers, and we'll take a deeper dive on that further in the presentation. But for sky wave propagation, when your transmitter site, and we'll say that that is the person on the left-hand side of the Earth, they emit a signal, and that signal goes up and refracts off the ionosphere at what is called an incident angle. Now, if you look across the surface of the Earth, you see that we have ground wave propagation, and then we have an area called the skip zone. In the skip zone, it's very difficult to hear or make contacts. Outside of the skip zone, to the right, where we have the other person, that would be our skip distance, and that's where sky wave propagations work very well. Now, the distance of this skip will vary greatly depending upon the incident angle. We're going to take a deeper look at that as well. I wanted to go over this concept in these terms to make sure that everybody is familiar and understands them. So when we talk about NVIS, we need to consider the incident angle and the D layer. The D layer is the most densely formed layer of the ionosphere. It is only present during the daytime, and it is reliant on solar activity to create ionized or charged particles. The D layer absorbs lower frequencies and will limit their ability to take advantage of sky wave propagation. And I'm talking about 13 to 14 megahertz, but it's really more the 40, 60, and 80 meter bands. Typically, we see the 40 meter band during the day. Absorption in the D layer is dependent on frequency and incident angle. The steeper the incident angle, characteristic of ENVIS, the less D layer the signal needs to traverse. So the signals become attenuated or absorbed the longer they spend time in the D layer. 
With the near vertical incident angle, the time that they spend in the D layer is significantly reduced, and this allows the refraction to take place. The D layer is very dense. Lower frequencies will collide with more free electrons contributing to absorption. The D layer is the most dense at midday. Okay, in this picture, we depict the ionosphere, crudely, I admit. On the right-hand side, you can see a moon, which represents nighttime. On the left-hand side, we have a sun, which represents daytime. And then you can see on the right-hand side at night, the F1 and F2 layers collapse into a single F layer. The E layer stays intact, and the D layer disappears. The D layer is around 70 to 90 kilometers high. The E layer is 90 to 160 kilometers high, with the F1 and F2 layers being around 160 to 400 kilometers high. This diagram shows the different types of incident angles that we work with. The important thing is to understand that for NVIS, we look for an acute angle, very acute. Acute means the angle is less than 90 degrees. The red angle is about 90 degrees, but my art skills are not that good, so it's a little bit, little bit more acute than that. And then the yellow angle is more obtuse, which means it's greater than 90 degrees. You can see with a more acute angle, the skip distance that we discussed earlier is shorter, and that's what makes Envis work in addition to less time spent traversing the D layer. You can see with the red and more so with the yellow angles that our incident angle spends more time in the D layer, which would create an opportunity for more attenuation and absorption, which is what we don't want. So let's go over how the ionosphere impacts HF propagation. Conditions in the ionosphere cause radio transmissions to behave differently depending upon frequency. The ionosphere conditions vary greatly based on the time of day. There's something called the maximum usable frequency, sometimes referred to as MUF. This is the highest frequency that can be used to communicate via skyway propagation at a given time. For example, if the MUF is 14.300 MHz, Transmissions made at 28.500 MHz will penetrate the ionosphere and travel into space. The lowest usable frequency, or the LUF. This is, during daylight hours, the D layer of the ionosphere absorbs RF, generally at lower frequencies. This limits the workable bands to those between the LUF and the MUF. If the LUF is at a frequency higher than the MUF, transmissions relying on sky wave propagation are not possible. So let's talk a little bit about the NVIS advantages. NVIS antennas are very easy to deploy because they're low height above ground. They are less directional because you're relying on your incident angle to be almost straight up and straight back down. If somebody was to do direction finding on the signal to see where it's coming from, they would see that it is coming from above. This makes it very useful from a military or tactical standpoint. NVIS avoids obstacles. We talked about line of sight. If, if you have a giant mountain between you and the person you're trying to make contact with via line of sight, you may have some difficulties. Even with other types of skywave propagation, if the takeoff angle is low enough that it hits the mountain, it's not going to work as well. So that's why we use something like Envis. Envis is very hard to fox hunt because it is less directional. Envis has very low noise because the antenna's relative height above ground. NVIS can be very reliable in showing solid communications. It's a simple antenna, and it can be made better with a reflector. Let's talk about some disadvantages to NVIS. There's all kinds of companies out there using marketing gimmicks to sell expensive antennas that they refer to as tactical antennas and label them NVIS. There's a lot of fake news and bad information about NVIS, sometimes claiming that NVIS communications can go much longer than they actually can. With NVIS, it should be used in coordination with other NVIS operators. If you're trying to make a contact with somebody who does not have an NVIS style or installed antenna, it is often higher above the ground than the NVIS antenna, and that means that its radiation pattern or far field plot likely doesn't have the same receive gain as an NVIS antenna, and they may struggle to hear you. And conversely, when they transmit, their gain is probably at a different takeoff angle than yours, which means they would go over you because you would be inside the skip zone. Because of the interactions with the D layer, NVIS does have a disadvantage with the number of frequencies that can be used. That's typically why it's limited to 40 meters during the day. And the range is somewhat limited. We talked about that earlier with 400 miles being the sweet spot. 
So here's an example of a dipole mounted in a standard configuration. In this case, it's a 40 meter dipole mounted 20 meters above ground, which would be one half of a wave. And then you can see on the right hand side of this picture that our takeoff angle is lower. This is a standard typical thing that you would see with a dipole. You can also see the directionality on the left hand side. In this next picture, we're gonna take a look at an antenna that is mounted 10 meters above the ground. Still a little bit high for Envis, but it illustrates our purposes. You can see the directionality has been lessened. And then you can see most of our radiation is going up at very steep angles. And what we talked about is 75 to around 90% incident takeoff angle works very well for Envis. And you can see in this diagram that much of our energy is going upwards, not outwards like the last picture. So what I wanna do is I wanna to go to this particular picture that does a comparison. The red line represents the antenna mounted at 10 meters. The black line represents the antenna mounted at 20 meters. And you can see a significant difference in the radiation strength vertically versus horizontally on the right hand side of the diagram. Here's an example of a simple Envis antenna that can be built relatively easily and quite affordably. So in this particular example, our driven element is mounted 0.15% of a wavelength above ground. Our antenna is a very simple center fed dipole mounted horizontally. The length of our dipole is a half of a wavelength of our frequency of interest. Now below the antenna, right above the ground, we have a reflector that's 5% longer than our driven element. And what this does is it stops the ground from absorbing all of our power and radiation and forces it up. And this adds to our ability to have a stronger signal moving up vertically. This is going to wrap up our simple introduction to Envis antennas and propagation. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or recommendations, go ahead and post them below and I'll do my best to respond. As always, thank you for watching.